I thought for so long, like, in order to be important and valued, I need to be like my brothers and my dad. Right. Wow. Okay. That's what I thought. Yep. Like, just, I, I, I always used to say, I'm built for tough. My yeah. daddy used to drive yeah. tractors. I'm like, I'm built for tough. I'm built for tough. And my value and worth came from this place of looking like a man. Yeah. Little did I know what I what was happening was I was insecure about being a woman. Right. That I thought it was right. so fickle and so weak and so right. this and so that, that I had missed that God had uniquely created me with that tenderness and the nurturing. And now that I have babies, I'm even more grateful that I've walked into the fullness of being a woman. And honestly, like I got tired of being Ford Tough. So I'm taking this class right now because I'm a nerd. Okay. And take as many classes as I can. You're a nerd in the best sense of the term. Though. Well, and you're a theology Bible. I mean, Jesus classes nerd. just quicken me. Yeah. They do. Yeah. I'm like a forever student. But the entire class is on the first two chapters of Genesis, mm. and it's just all about That's creation. Awesome. And it's just yeah. Yeah. got me in the Garden of Eden, right? Yeah. Which is a great place to be, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm just thinking about women. Eve being in the Garden of Eden. Right. And there's this story that keeps coming up for me. I don't know y'all's story, your beginnings of, of being women in ministry and doing the things that you're doing in the world. But when I was in my early 20s, mm -hmm. I was freshly on staff at a church, baby, rookie in every way. And there was this older man in the congregation. He had been a pastor for so many years. His name was Jerry. We called him Pastor Jerry. And he had retired and was going to this church. And almost every Sunday, he would come up to me and he would just be like, Christy, I really wanted to ask you this question or ask if you would pray for me. And it just blew me away because here's this older man yeah. coming to me. And I just felt like, and he would often say, you know, like women were in the garden, like Eve was in the garden of Eden. Right. Like women had a place in God's story from the very beginning. That's right. And I could, I could start crying actually as I've thought about that story because he was one of those early voices yeah. early on in my journey and story yeah. that was kind of naming me, helping yeah. me sort of find myself yeah. as a woman in ministry, in the yeah. church, and in the world. Yeah. And when I think about when the Bible talks about us being created in the image and the likeness yeah. of God and, and what that raises for you as women, what comes up for you yeah. Yeah. when you think about that, that yeah. woman was not an afterthought. Uh, exactly. uh, we are in the beginning of the story. Yeah. Just what does that do for you? Because it, it humbles me and it gives me courage. Yeah. At the same time. That's really good. So I don't know. I'm just in the Garden of Eden, y'all. Can y'all just, just go to the Garden with me? I'm, just, I do, I'm yeah. ready to go back to the Garden. Let yes. me tell you that. I don't know. For me, it's interesting. I, I read this book uh, called Captivating by John Eldridge, and it totally changed my whole perspective when it came to being a woman and how God created me. And the line that got me and that gets me every time, anytime I'm in a room full of women, I always say this, like, God created all, you know, the earth, the moon, and the stars, everything in it, all the thillions of animals, the ones that we know. A lot of them we don't know because yeah. I've been on Instagram and then seen a little animal and I'm like, what is that? Okay. <laughs> um, and then he created woman as like what John Eldridge says is the, the period to earth's creation. Mm -hmm. And for me, oftentimes when I feel like I'm last, picked last for some things, mm -hmm. for ministry opportunities, for church opportunities, mm -hmm. when I'm last because maybe I'm not strong enough or quick enough or direct enough mm -hmm. that um, maybe I wasn't supposed to be. Maybe God created me as a form of completion. Maybe there's some things in my life, in my family, that I'm supposed to complete, that I'm supposed to hold and be the period. And when I look at that in the Bible and I look at the order in which God created the earth, I'm like, we're not last, baby. Yeah. We're completion. When I think about being made in the image of God um, as a woman, it raises both humility and courage in me. It raises humility because I need the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the people of God to help me to healthily reflect that image of the living God into the world. And it also gives me courage um, because if the living God found me worthy of being created in His image, then it gives me the courage to go live in His image. When I think about what it even means to be a Christian, like how would you define that? If somebody came up to you on all three at Target and said, somebody told me you're a Christian, what does that even mean? You think about how you would answer that. 
But for me, being a Christian is simply somebody who is trying to follow Jesus in this world. And by following Him, I mean being like Him in this world so that if someone's never heard of Jesus, if someone doesn't know Jesus for themselves, they could get a little bit of a better picture of who He is and what He's like from being around me, the Imago Day in me, and me living as a follower of Jesus in this world. It's some Garden of Eden stuff. I love that you started with Eve. Um, not only does it make sense in biblical narrative, but I think um, I think how you, as a Christian woman, how you perceive Eve kind of sets the trajectory for the rest of your life as a woman. Mm-hmm. And I think she has been unduly vilified oh, yeah. in theology because all we see is original sin. But I'm I'm a little bit stuck in the best sense of the word at the edge of Eden mm. because I grew up with that that Genesis 3 where where God drives them out yeah. after she gets seduced by the fruit salesman and takes a bite of the rotten <laughs> apple. I, I see God driving them out. And it wasn't until uh, one of my first classes at Den Sim when we had a professor talking about the redemptive thread through history that he yeah. started with Eve. And he said, if you understand that right there when you think she kind of ruins it for all creation and she's yeah. forever painted with with dark brush strokes. Um, if you understand that when it says God drives them out, the word there in Hebrew is gal rosh. And another meeting is to herd redemptively. So he's not drop kicking her out of Eden. He's actually beginning the redemptive process because if they turned around and came back into the garden ate from the tree of life, they'd be forever stuck, not able to engage with a God who loves them so much. Mm-hmm. So I see her as broken, but so forgiven and so loved yeah. and shepherded by her creator, who she's made in the image yeah. of. So anyway, I think we need, I think we need a little reschooling on Eve. Lisa. I love that. That's yeah. so that true. just like, I don't know, that changed my whole perspective just right mm-hmm. then and there. I hope somebody caught that. Well, we see her as such a bad girl. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. just like us. Yeah. She made a yeah, really like bad Everybody's choice. good and everybody's bad, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we all I got mean, a little bit of both. Apart yeah. from Jesus, I'm mostly yeah. bad. Right. <laughs> um, but the fact that him shepherding him, them yes. out of the garden is not punitive. Yeah. It's protective. Yeah. I just love that. And that redemption included women from the very beginning, right from the start, God said, you know, you will be part of the redemption story. Mm -hmm. And it's not complete without you. Yeah. We went all the way back to Genesis to talk about the inherent value of men and women um, to fulfill God's purpose in in redeeming uh, the history of humanity. And I love that from the very beginning, you see this um, this dignity in Eve. We have done such a bad job of kind of creating Eve as this um, antagonist fictor, figure in redemptive history. She messed up. She, she made a mistake, like all of us do pretty much every day or every hour of the day. But God redeemed her story. And you start with Eve, and then you see woman after woman after woman after woman. Sometimes church tradition tends to minimize the role of women in redemptive history and elevate the role of men. But if you really study the Bible in the proper context, both were used. There's this beautiful redemptive tandem between men and women and the way all of us have an inherent value and dignity and all of us are Imago Dei. That means all of us were made in the image of God. A woman wasn't made in the image of man. Woman was made in the image of God, both male and female. He created us. And so pretty cool that from the very beginning, you see that God doesn't play favorites. He loves his daughters just as much as he loves his sons. I do feel like there's a lot of limitations that women put on themselves because they're women. Absolutely. And I've been there in my life, especially early on. And I, I think I had to come to a place where I... I saw my womanhood as a asset and a Mm -hmm. blessing because Mm -hmm. for so long I was this passionate zealot that Mm -hmm. knew my gifts were to teach people. It was, it was leadership and and teaching. And so as a woman growing up in conservative church, I didn't know, I didn't know that Mm -hmm. that was okay. And Mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of women have to work through that where they almost feel, um, 
bad if they have big gifts. And yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not to try to change anybody's mind, yeah. but to go, okay, there's some places in scripture that you go, okay, taken out of context, what does oh, that yeah. mean? And yeah. Does it mean confused. we're second class yeah. citizens? Yeah. And you go, well, let's let's look at, as you said, Ruth, the whole redemptive picture yeah. of scripture. Yeah. Because again, if you start crooked with Eve, mm-hmm. you see everything through a hermeneutic and a lens through which you see yeah. scripture. Yep. That is, women are somewhere lower on the yeah. ladder of abstraction yeah. from God. And oh, that's yeah. not at okay. All What's what happening? he's saying. So whatever stream of the church you're in, there's some stream of the churches that that, that will have a difference of opinion. That's okay. That's nuance. Yeah. To get to our value mm-hmm. as women, mm-hmm. we can all agree on that mm-hmm. because it, that's clear in Scripture. So we all place limitations on our life for different reasons. And I think of my my kid's teacher that was so wise and so godly. I respected her so much. In fact, I thought of her when one of the younger girls in my life was looking for a mentor. And so I came to her and I asked her if she would be willing to mentor this girl. And her immediate reaction was, I don't do that because I've been divorced. And my heart sank because there was some Thing, some lie that at some point in her life she believed that she was disqualified from pouring into other people's lives because it's something that had happened to her, probably many things that had happened to her in her past. And I just want to say to any of you that feel like I'm disqualified because of difficult decisions that you've had to make, because of circumstances you've been through, because of sin that you've participated in, because of even for perhaps the fact that you're a woman and you feel like I can't use these gifts, I just want to say that is not biblical. God works with our weakness. In fact, from our weakness, and many times the the story of God goes out. It is not limited because of our, our mistakes. Those mistakes are what display His glory. We have been forgiven. We have been set apart. We have been made right with God. That's the story of the gospel, and we get to go give that away if we're willing to trust Him and to believe that it's true, that we can we can go and be forgiven. I love that you're going back to the source. It's interesting now that I have two kids, one girl and one boy. I had a a little girl for so long. Um, And we do these daily affirmations for them. Like Dylan, my daughter, we say things like, you are brave and you're smart and you're beautiful inside and out. Like trying to teach her those principles before the world comes and says, you're just beautiful on the outside. You're loved by God. And I was talking to my husband, Sam, about, okay, what are are our affirmations going to be for this little boy? Because I kind of sort of don't know. Like I know it's not you're beautiful inside and out. Right. Right. Um, And he's just like, let's say things like courageous and wise and honest and a man of valor. And I'm like, oh, it's so gritty. And it's interesting because then I think about Genesis chapter one, verse 26, when it says, you know, let us make uh, mankind in our image and our likeness. Mm -hmm. And I think about how intricately different we are as man and woman. And when I look at my two kids, they're just so different, but I'm speaking those words of life into the makeup that they have in God's image very uniquely. And it's almost like I've learned to value how God made woman because I have kind of this contrast now with my son and my daughter. And I just wonder if the body could do a better job at honoring the unique intricacies of how God implanted his image in us, but very different. And if we belittle either side, then we're really just belittling the whole of the image of God That's right. because we got both. Yeah. That's but right. if we can hold both with grace and kindness and acceptance and right. nuance a little yeah. bit, because yeah. I got this little girl who needs to hear some certain things and I got this little boy now who needs to hear some certain things, I think God gets a little bit bigger. You know, I'm I'm really aware that it's very difficult to find people that will speak life into you when you become an adult, right? Like, it's really difficult to find people that'll remind you of who you are in Christ, to give you affirmations. And so for the person watching right now, I, I want to remind you that even if you don't have anyone around you, maybe no community, maybe not a husband, maybe, you know, your parents are not alive or with us anymore or have been a part of your life, I want to remind you that God's Word is full of beautiful affirmations. And I think the best way that we can start to create affirmations for ourselves is to first access the lies. What is it that the enemy has planted in you? For me, it's I'm unsafe, I'm unprotected, I'm not worthy, I have to do in order to be worth something I cannot just be or exist. And so because I know those lies about myself that are so untrue, right? 
Um, I can now go into scripture and say, okay, Lord, what do you say about those things? And it's about a Google away, okay, from finding scripture that speak directly against the lies. And from that place, you can start to create affirmations that you can say to yourself every single day. And if you're a mama out there, a really great way to reparent your heart is to speak the affirmations that you needed to hear to your child and simultaneously hold those affirmations for your heart too. I grew up in a culture where sometimes I'd get off the plane and a long lost relative would, the first thing that would be said of me is, you gained weight or you lost weight. Oh, or, oh, you look so pretty. Or the value mm -hmm. assigned to me was, look at her outfit. Yeah. She looks so pretty. Right. Your it's daughter external. is so beautiful. Yeah. And so we were always created and meant to worship the one true God, not right. one another. That's but right. we assign power based on, we sure um, you know, how beautiful you are mm -hmm. or how, for a man, maybe how powerful or how strong yeah, yeah. or, um, you know, we're not assigning power to sensitivity, for example. Right. So then we start assigning these things and then grasping for that and, and worshiping right. one another. And well, our, it, yeah, you know. we ascribe worth and we detract worth Absolutely. based on things that God doesn't. No, nope. and it was never meant to be. Or never yeah. meant to be. So growing up in an Asian American home and just between my Western and Eastern cultures, I think a lot of times I try to find my identity in and worth in what I achieved or accomplished or the grades that I got when I was a child or how much people liked me. And friends, it was a, an, an exhausting, an exhausting chase, right? Constantly trying to chase approval and worth. When I came to Christ and when I go into the page of the scripture and see his love for us, the redeemed, and we start seeing how he transforms our lives and gives us a new identity, suddenly we realize all the ways in which we were trying to find our worth in our achievements or approval from others are all worthless attempts. And at the end of the day, wow, he wants to rewrite our stories and give us identities in Him. And friends, I just really encourage you um, to find your identity in Him because that's the only thing that will ever satisfy. Please tell me, since we're drifting toward worth and the worth of a woman, yeah. please tell me you're gonna go to Ezra Konegdo since we're at Eve and we're in Genesis. Please, please, please. Uh Let's go to Ezra Kenegdo. Truncate, truncate <laughs> for us, a oh, wise rabbi. So back to the Genesis. Um, you know, it's so interesting just to nerd out a little bit. You know, the Bible is one creation story of many given to us out of that Middle Eastern, ancient Near Eastern world. And I teach some of this at the college where I teach. And, and when I discovered this, it was fascinating. In most creation stories, woman is either not even mentioned mm -hmm. She's not even in the story. Or if she's present, she's so weak and fickle. She's like a pawn in the hands right. of the gods, easily right. overcome, um, easily abused. And so it's out of that world of creation stories that God writes his. Yeah. And so when we're reading Genesis, we're, we're, we're learning to hear it and read it among these other stories where woman's either not even present yeah. or she's weak and fickle. And so the first two words in Genesis that describes woman um, in Genesis 2.18, I will make a helper suitable for him. And that phrase in Hebrew for helper suitable, it's Ezer Konegdo. And I learned this when I was studying in Israel and it literally bent my brain. Yeah. I mean, I was a different creature before this and after it because that word helper, I'm from rural Mississippi. Come on. Deep South. Yeah. You know, right. we put sugar right. in our tea. Yeah. You know, it's like sugar you in fry our grits. Everything, you baby. know, you fry everything butter, and very butter much everywhere. conservative, just rural church. And so a helper out of my world, my Southern world is someone secondary. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The yeah. secondary helps the primary. Right. The helper helps the main one. They're subservient. It's subservient. It's sec- right. Yeah, subservient, secondary. And Ezer in Hebrew, it essentially means helper, aid, or strength, but it's a very strong word. And it carries the idea of strengthening someone in a way they cannot do for themselves. And what just bent my brain and like (laughs) changed my whole soul the moment I learned this was that throughout the Bible, like usually when we see this word Ezer, it's a word that God uses to describe himself in relation to Israel. Mm. Yep, yep, yep. And yep, yep, so yep, yep, yep. And we would never say that God was secondary to Israel. Oh, sure. We would say God helped, aided, and strengthened yes. Israel in ways she could not do for herself. Yes. So I'm sitting here going, time out. Stop, wait. Time out. The first word that God chose to use in the narrative of the Bible to describe woman is a word he uses to describe himself. I think I could cry right now. And the honor in that. Isn't it lovely? And and the invitation in that. And the, you not only have a place in the room, you have a seat at the table from the beginning. Well, think about to help. Like when you are in trouble and help shows up, that is a force. Yes. That is strong. Yes. That is a powerful thing. And we're craving help. All of us are. And and that's where my my ministry changed. When I realized I had things to give Mm -hmm. that that God put me on earth to give, that I had means to help. When I got my eyes off of myself and my role and my gender and my and the permissions that have been Mm -hmm. given to me in life, and I began to look at the need around me, my heart welled up. And I really, I've got chill bumps on my face, y'all. I really (laughs) didn't care anymore who I was or how I was qualified Mm -hmm. or what I had to give or how gifted I was. All of a sudden it was them. And it was, I see hopelessness and I have hope. Mm -hmm. And that is, I'm just thinking of all the women that have shut themselves down for any number of reasons. Y'all, because one thing we are great at is shutting ourselves down. And so when I think of, of women that are are aching to to matter and to to have a story to be part right. of right. of a story that God would yeah. use them in people's lives and they're waiting for something. I'm like, wait, just think about the people that need what you That's have, right. yeah. and that changes everything. Yeah, I thought about it when you said, you know, the the leader, the yeah. teacher in me, yeah. and how those are viewed as like front facing things. Yeah. And so like, as a woman, it's like, are we allowed to do those things? How do we walk right. into this? And I think about how in Ezra, because so much of our theology is vertical. That's right. What I think the kingdom is lateral. I agree. Brothers and sisters mm-hmm. in the yeah. faith were side by side. Right. You know, that other word, connecto, that helper suitable, it literally means somebody who stands in front of you facing face you. Face to face. Face to face. Yeah. So like, what is woman in this world? We're meant to be side by side and face to face. Well, and the other thing that bothers me about this passage and how we interpret it in the church is it's always about marriage. Yeah. But when you, you're you seeing it set up That's right. That's of, right. of places of authority that God's giving us, yes. right. because so much of the context of the scripture in that part is authority, yeah. right? Yeah. right? They're about to go name the animals. They're given right. a, a mission yeah. together. Um, and I think of how many people that feel like I need to get married before I can have an impact and before I can win Lisa Harper. <laughs> that was not a struggle for you. Like you just Oh, knew. it was a struggle, but we are all created in His image. Yeah. So we all have inherent yeah. dignity, yeah. value. We all have divine gifts. But first, it's to worship Him. Yeah. It's yeah. it's to love Him with all our hearts, to live Christiformic lives who are shaped like Jesus. Yeah. And then it's to love the world around us. Yeah. And that is not, that does not have to be, um, that does not always have to be in the context of marriage. As a matter of fact, the New Testament is all about right. community. That's right. And right. so That's many exactly of the passages right. that we do get wonky about women, it's because we take something and we go, well, this applies holistically. It's like, he actually wasn't talking about that there. Paul was saying, y'all get to live so differently than the world. You live with such hope in a world that is hopeless. Do that in a way, love one another so well 
in community, yeah. not just marriage, as sisters, as yeah. friends, mm -hmm. as totally platonic yeah. relationships with your kids, right. that the world will take notice and go, gosh, that looks totally different than the way I'm yeah. orienting my life. Yeah. It wasn't about, yeah. it wasn't about that kind of hierarchical well, and submission. And in heaven, we won't even have marriage. Right? I know. So, yeah. so, I know. so it, what, there's such yes. a story. So going I need to on. hurry up, so don't good. I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a few yeah. years. Oh, just yeah. a few. Just a few. <laughs> All of us are looking for a purpose. We're looking for how are we unique? How are we special? How am I going to make a name for myself? This is as old as the day is long. Every generation has struggled with this. It's not new because of the internet or because of Hollywood. This is something that every generation has wanted to do with their lives. But the power of understanding the Bible, the power of understanding specifically even just creation in Genesis is that God built us in his image to display his glory that we are image bearers of god changes everything about our lives and also it changes everything about the way we treat other people so all those people that you feel mad at that that are making you crazy because of their politics or because of their decisions or because of what they how they're living or what they're doing they are image bearers of god as well all humans bear the image of God because we were created by Him and for Him and through Him. And so there's a storyline that God is inviting you to be a part of. However, sometimes we miss it because we put ourselves down or we put other people down and we don't love the people we're, we're put in our lives to love. We are challenged by them. We are pushing back against them. And so the story of God is that that He forgave us so that we can forgive other people. and. And that value and worth is, is present in our lives and other people's lives just because they were made and designed by God. So I'm, I wanted to ask y'all a question because you've all sort of talked about like growing into a sense of yes. your calling, getting yes. more comfortable with it. Yeah. I'm curious to hear like who's been a part of that mm. in y'all's lives yeah, because I, I will say that. I was walking my dog this week <laughs> thinking about that. And it has been my brothers yes. in the faith mm -hmm. so often so, yeah. that that came along. I'm an only child. I always yeah. wanted siblings. The fact that you've got six boys, just I want to come have dinner with you. I always Please. tell you that, like yeah. see all of that energy at the table. But I have a really good guy friend in ministry. Lisa knows him, Curtis Zachary. Yeah. We've been friends for over 20 years, and he really does feel like my brother. Yeah. Like, I don't know what it's like to have a blood brother, but the way I love him, I think that's what it feels like. Yeah. And there have been points in my journey. I remember one time, without getting too deep into it, I had just made a huge ministry transition, left a place I'd been for 17 years, felt like a leap. Yeah. I was scared to death. And he knew and took me to coffee. And he just looked at me, and he was like, Christy, I'm just so tired of watching you run mm -hmm. with somebody holding your shirt from behind. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. Wow! Mm -hmm. And it's time for you to step out. Mm -hmm. We've got you. We're wow. with you. And y'all, uh, yes. any woman could have yep. said that to yeah. me. And, and it would have, but it was like my brother, yeah. Yeah. like yeah, taking me to coffee and, yeah. and yeah. squaring up to me. And giving me that gift, yeah. I've never forgotten that. And it was oh, almost seven so years ago at this point as I'm sitting here now. Yeah. And sometimes when I see him, I'll, I'll remind him of that. And he didn't even remember mm. saying it. But I just think about that male-female yep. harmony. I yeah. think of harmony, yeah. brother, sister, not just yeah. marriage. I appreciate you saying yeah. that as yeah, one who's too. not married. Yes. Um, too, but there's Jenny. been such a strengthening in my own life and history and ministry yeah. and just life of my being side by side with my yeah. brothers. Yeah. So I'm curious who played a role yeah. in you all growing into your Okay, souls. This is interesting because I really did not understand like the woman male dynamic in the church for a long time. Oftentimes in the African community, African American community, we ain't got that. We just everybody right. preaching and doing their thing. Right. It is what it is. Right. And so I didn't realize that I had people doing this for me until I was well into ministry. First was my daddy. We grew up in the Catholic church. I mean, we really didn't know any difference, but I was an altar girl. I had the robe with the little rope and I was dangling other little incidents. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. But I didn't know that my dad, unfortunately, y'all, he's he is redeemed at this point. But he went and like went off on the priest because they said I couldn't do it. I had no idea. I was like eight. But my dad was like, she gonna be an altar girl on Sunday, order the robe. 
like no. in the priest face. No. Then <laughs> I started to, I, I wanted to like teach. My dad was like, she is going to be a pastor. She going to be a pastor. I know she is. And Lord, wow. I was like, bless his soul because I was so ratchet for so long. I didn't know if it was going to come to pass. But he was like, I want her to read on Sunday. I want her to read the first reading. And he looked at the priest. He said, you better let her do it. What and I read. Yeah. <laughs> He was breaking glass ceilings that I didn't. Yeah. I wasn't even wow. aware of. I wow. was like, oh, I'm an altar girl. They're altar girls. Oh, I'm teaching on a Sunday in a Catholic church, mm. like saying good morning church up there as like a middle schooler. And then when I became a youth pastor, I just had this mentor that was like, I'm a youth pastor. See something in you. I believe in you. Here, preach here. Do this, do that. I had no idea. What's great, I think, about that, though, is because I didn't have those realistic like limitations, once I started to get around my sister, sisters who were deeply wounded, who were hurt, I kind of became like the like tangible courage. Mm. Right. And the and I think I became tangible truth to women that was like, well, Tony is doing it. And if God can do it through her, she can do, like he can do it through me. Mm-hmm. But I had like glass ceilings broken yeah. for me by men and I didn't even know it. Yeah. I was just bopping around preaching so thinking it was good. all good. When I think about identifying the people that I'm going to let in, I don't know how you would answer that, what your grid is, who is it that sort of gets past the veil for you, that can speak encouragement to you, that can speak truth to you. But for me, I look for somebody that I can actively watch them pursuing the living God. They are active in their faith. We might say that life isn't so much happening to them, but they are happening to life is a way that I might word it. Um, Because I'm a passionate person and I'm a person on the move. I'm a little bit mischievous, I'm adventurous, I love to travel, I like to go. And so when I see another follower of Jesus, with some of those same characteristics that really want to engage with the kingdom of God, seeing heaven brought to to earth. Those are the kind of people that I want in my life, in my corner, because that kind of passion is going to do both of those things. They will encourage me and they will also challenge me. They will nurture me in the things of the faith, and they'll also hold me accountable. And I think in those two, and sometimes they even feel like a tension, but I think it's really a harmony. None of us grows up into our fullness in Christ without some encouragement and some challenge. And so I would just encourage you to think through who are those people in your everyday life that you're witnessing them actively running after the things of God. And I would say they would be really good people for you to have in your corner and in your community. I think my husband has played a huge part in this for me, which is kind of a strange thing when I think about the fact that when we got married, we went out to seminary and I wasn't trying to go lead a church. We were actually going to be missionaries overseas and we were both in the same program. And we weren't really weighed down with a whole lot of like, is it okay or is it not okay? That that wasn't even on our minds. We just honored the fact that we both wanted to study together. We just wanted to be partners in the truest sense. And I remember years down the road, it's too long of a story, but we ended up not being full-time missionaries. We were called to a rural part of Colorado, lay ministry, just doing normal jobs. And um, before he ended up going into the pastorate, but when he became a pastor, I went kicking and screaming into motherhood. And I was like, oh, I'm made for all these other things. And God actually gave me a season where I did have six boys. Mm -hmm. Motherhood grew on me and I absolutely loved being a mom. Mm -hmm. But the truth is the first maybe decade, I was like, I was made for more than sweeping up Cheerios. Mm -hmm. And it was in that context that Troy kept saying, "Your, um, your seminary education, we did not finish at the time. But he's like, apply it right now. Like this is influence. And so it's interesting because that 15 or so years of hiddenness, what we would call hiddenness, where I was preaching the gospel at my kitchen table with my kids and with their friends and with the the college girls that would come over and prep dinner with me. And that's where discipleship happened. Um, That is what actually overflows now in my public ministry, but it wasn't, it didn't start here. And so it was my husband empowering, encouraging me saying, you're equipped, go and do it right, right where you are. That's 
I'm sure men are listening as well. And mm-hmm. I, I think men have played a huge role in my yeah. life, including my husband yeah. and pastors mm-hmm. and elders that have just been for me. Mm-hmm. And I know that's not every woman's experience, yeah. but it is out there and yeah. it is oh, yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful for so many brothers mm-hmm. that continue to just yes. give me a seat at the table yeah. And, yeah. and to praise yeah. me and to support yeah. me. Knowing that God created women with purpose and intent and that we were not an afterthought completely changes the way I view my everyday, that I'm not just filling my time, I am not doing work that somebody else can't do or doesn't have time for, that God's given me purpose and has written me and womanhood into the redemption story. And so when I think about all the things that are spectacular that I get to do and all the mundane things, it transforms our daily lives when we recognize and realize that in the heart of God, He created man and woman to be part of His redemption story. When I was growing up, I'm almost 60, so I'm even further um, down the road uh, than y'all, also very conservative church culture. And one of the first things I remember hearing when I thought, too, I I think I'm supposed to teach the Bible. I think that's what God's called me Mm -hmm. to, is basically you can't. And then my very first uh, Mm -hmm. gentleman, who was very well-intentioned, who I worked for in a parachurch ministry, uh, told me that he was going to pay me exactly half of what he was going to pay my my male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And if I had a problem with that, then I didn't have a gentle and quiet spirit. And so, you know, all those verses are in there out of context. I was told at one ministry that I would sin if I wore open-toed shoes. Because as a woman, the line between my big toe and my second toe was reminiscent of cleavage, and I would cause my brothers to stumble. And so, oh, that's straight up, straight up. So all I'm saying is, hopefully, we don't have a ton of women listening who've had those same kind of uh, the opposite of affirmations. But I grew up thinking, for me to me God, for me to be godly, and to really be God honoring means I make myself less, because that's what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible that's says. The Bible that's says. what a few verses taking, yeah. taken wildly out of context mm-hmm. say. When he yeah. says man is the glory of God and woman is the glory of man, yes. he's not putting us on a hierarchical right. scale and saying we're less than. Right. And again, I think it goes back to the beginning. Uh, I read something recently from a very prominent spiritual leader mm. who said, if you have ever had a woman in your church on a Sunday, basically your church was not a God-honoring church. And you go because it's not just glass ceilings. It is a theological position Mm -hmm. for many, many, many streams of the church. And it's the way they read the silencing passages too, specifically in the New Testament, where there are really well-intentioned believers who really do think it's sin for a woman to lead in a church setting in any way, shape, or form. And so I think some of it is to go, let's, let's be kind and wise. Let's go, okay, does the Bible really say that? Mm. Let's talk about context, what was going on in that culture, because you had, by the grace of God, a dad who, even if he didn't know the the multi-Slavic theological terms, he knew, no, God has gifted Tony this Mm -hmm. way, so he'll make a way for. There's other women, daughters, who don't have a dad like that, and who are under well-intentioned yeah. authority that goes, no, the Bible says, and they so want to honor the Lord. And yeah. so I think we've got to talk about this and talk about it with, with yeah. grace, but with biblical wisdom and to help people who even now might be listening going, they're saying stuff I've never heard in church and I've been in church my whole life yeah. to go, all right, let's, let's, let's talk about what God says, yeah. not just about what church tradition. Mm-hmm. Says to be humble enough to say, I need to have fresh eyes and think through the whole context of scripture, the character of God. What we're actually dealing with is not necessarily roles and positions and jobs. We're we're limiting that. Yeah, I've I've experienced that myself, especially I'm a little older, so the era I grew up in in extremely conservative 
church culture, which I love because of the high view of, of Scripture, this love letter we call the Bible. But there are quite a few leaders that I've been under who definitely thought of women as kind of second-class citizens, especially with regards to sharing the gospel, with regards to any kind of um, uh, leadership position in uh, ecclesiastical uh, church culture. Um, and I think what I learned early on was wrong. What I learned early on was just kind of kind of make yourself smaller so that you don't offend anybody. As I've matured in my relationship with God and really found in His Word my worth, I've, I've begun to realize that I didn't do anybody favor, any favors by making myself smaller. Um, the other ditch is to lead from a wound and become really strident. But what I wish I had done at an earlier age is to take all of the gifts that God has given me with, woven with all my weaknesses that, that He gives me grace for and the sin He's forgiven me from, and just run as hard as I can toward Him uh, to employ the gifts He's given me um, in the work of building His kingdom. Um, I'm obviously a big talker. I have a hard time with these because I can't make it short enough. And so how can I tell stories? that make Jesus the hero. So I don't need to worry about whether other people approve of, of how I'm stewarding my story and running toward Jesus. I need to make sure I'm dancing for His approval, and I need to do that with kindness and humility and gratitude and respect the other image bearers I get to do life with, but not allow anybody um, to say I'm less than because I'm a female. And I just want to yeah. say that there is, you know, yeah. local churches are doing the best they can. I think most are. most elders are not vicious. They That's just right. are working yeah, through well the That's verses exactly that they're accountable right. to God for, right? And yeah, so absolutely. I feel like one thing that has served me well is just to to trust that God will give me the opportunities and the freedom and the permission yeah. to do those things yeah. um, when it's time. And that has been true for me. And yeah. and yeah. so I think it's also okay to just be in places of, you know what, this this isn't an opportunity I have or is given to me in this moment, and I'm going to trust God. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's also okay if if you need to go to a different church, if, if no longer you can submit yep. to that and you need to go okay. to a different church. Yeah. But I, yeah, I just think it's hard. It's hard uh, for— I, lo I it's love hard that to you're lead. talking about the tension. Yeah. Because yeah. I Absolutely. think we think there's one perfect way to do it, and I'm like, no, I think our culture has gotten— with women, and especially um, and on the kind of the aftermath of the Me Too movement, yeah, and yeah. you've seen that infiltrate yeah. all culture, including Christian culture. And I think sometimes Christian women, because of the history of some misogyny and some streams of the church, yeah. we've gotten empowered confused with enraged. Yeah. And I'm like, no, oh, God listen. never, okay. ever That's calls you to okay. sin, yes. even yes. if you have been unduly oppressed by a well-intentioned or even not a well-intentioned yeah. authority. It does not justify that kind of, I, I see women leading from wounds yeah. as an uh, older woman, and I want to go, yeah. don't lead from a wound. Yeah. God doesn't redeem that. Find your wholeness in Jesus. Lead with your kids if you have the gift of having kids, yeah. and, and run hard toward Jesus, and He will make a way. But I so agree. Yeah. Don't There's get the way. empowerment of the Holy Spirit confused with being enraged because you were hurt. I really don't think I've ever missed any. Anything I was supposed to be doing. No. And Truly. that's Psalm yeah. 8411. No yeah. good thing that's will right. he withhold. So there, yeah. and yeah. look, I mean, to me, too, that thing that always mm -hmm. I come back to is look at our generation and look, yeah. we have more ability to to do things than right. probably any Absolutely. generation right. and then a lot of the world today, yeah, right? right? And so, yeah, I try to just go, you know, I know I'm the glass, I'm always the glasses half full girl, but yeah. Yeah. but yeah. I really do feel like I'm, I'm, grateful for the, yeah. the yes. yeses. That's and I'm right. grateful Absolutely. for that. And I don't feel like I'm, well, I'm and let's missing not something. Pick on the code of Babylon. Yeah. Because I'm like, no, you don't have to be angry and strident to be yeah. strong. Yeah. Yeah. God has imbued in us as women the ability to stand side to side, mm -hmm. to contend, yeah. but to do that also with tenderness. I never yeah. want to sacrifice yeah. my unique femaleness yes. on the altar of of being a boss. I'm like, I can be a boss and I can lead and I can still have a soft heart that's that's bent toward nurturing because he also made me a mom. See, that's the I think that's the thing that 
I, I really pray that women that are watching this right now, especially those that are young, like that they get that. That again, when God made us in his image, and it says it later on in Genesis, it, that he said it was good. Yeah. Very the way, good. It was very, 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 very good. good that the way he made us. And for so long, I grew up with three older brothers. My mom was very sick growing up. So I grew up with my super aggressive dad. And I thought for so long, like in order to be important and valued, I need to be like my brothers and my dad. Right. Wow. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Like, just, I, I, I always used to say, I'm built for tough. My daddy used to drive tractors. I'm like, I'm built for tough. I'm built for tough. And my value and worth came from this place of looking like a man. Yeah. Little did I know what I was, what was happening was I was insecure about being a woman. Right. Mm -hmm. That I thought it was right. so fickle yeah. and so weak and so right. this and so that, that I had missed that God had uniquely created me yeah. with that tenderness and the yeah. nurturing. And yeah. now that I have babies, I'm even more grateful that I've walked into the fullness of being a woman. Yeah. And honestly, like I got tired of being Ford Tough. Uh -huh. I got tired of leaving a, leading a household and being married to someone uh, before this marriage that, you know, I had to lead. I didn't want to wear the pants because I was operating outside of my unique yeah. wiring and yeah. it was stressful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that my husband, I'm like, you made this decision, brother. Okay. <laughs> you do, you lead on this little department over here. I love that I get to be home with my babies yeah. and hold them and cuddle them and be the nurturer. But it took me years to find value in that. So I talk about being insecure and being a woman and everything that the world kind of says about us in a negative light. Oh, you're weak and you're emotional and you know, you're not smart because you're so emotional and all these different things. And I had this really long journey as I talked about, about being insecure, about being a woman and wanting to be like a man because they were strong and powerful and in the lead. And I remember going to a spiritual encounter and reading the book Captivating by John Eldridge. And it became so clear to me that if we are all created in the Imago Dei, if we are all created in the image of God, then woman is like specifically designed with common traits of God. That if we are nurturing and we were built to, to carry emotion and to use our discernment and to value beautiful things, then God probably has those characteristics as well. And I think when I realized that I wasn't just like a weak woman and those were negative traits, but actually those beautiful characteristics of holding beauty and leaning into nurturing were something that God valued because it's something that God carried. Oh my gosh, it changed everything. It changed everything. And so I hope you're encouraged by that, maybe in your own insecurity about being a woman as well. You bring the best of a man and the best of a woman together. Oh, man, that's that's amazing. That's we aren't just better together as a sisterhood. That's exactly right. We're better together as a community right. with men and women yeah. running hard yeah. toward Jesus in their giftings. Yeah. That That is a redemptive force to contend with. Yeah, so. I think as we just come to a close, yeah. the thing that's sitting in my stomach is something you've said twice today, and it's the idea of, you were talking about that you women hold themselves back. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's true in my story. Nobody's ever held me back more than I've held myself back. And um, right. so as we just close for today, I'm just thinking about whoever's joining us today, man, woman, whoever, and just to kind of consider the ways that maybe you're not showing up for your own life, yeah. the ways that you're sitting back. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's no one out there. It's you. That's right. You don't know That's that you right. have a seat at the table. You don't know. You've not heard in a very long time um, that you were represented in the Garden of Eden, you know, mm -hmm. and that you're part of that harmony. And then let's just all ask the living God to yeah. help us show up for our own lives, you know, yeah. fully present yeah. in it. So let's just pray together. Uh, Father, just thank you for Genesis 1 and 2 and for a very good beginning and a very good story that we are a part of. Um, and yet here we are um, living in this modern world with planes, trains, and automobiles and all this kind of stuff. And Lord, you who were sovereign over Eden, um, you are still sovereign now. And so Lord, would you just give us the courage to take our seat at the table, um, to lean in, to live on the balls of our feet, not the hills. Um, would you continue equipping and mobilizing us as your Ezra Connectos in this world, these helper suitables um, to help aid and strengthen and to stand across from face to face. Um, Lord, you are good 
and what you have created is good and we are part of that creation and we love you and we love each other and we love the kingdom of God coming down to the ground. So have your way in all of it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. This is Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Man, there's a couple of huge takeaways from those two verses. One is our God is in us. He exists in perfect community in, in, um, in relationship. And He made us in His image. So we not only are hardwired for relationship, um, we have the image of God, um, which means we're inherently worthy, inherently valuable. And he includes man and woman in this creation account. That means there's no hierarchy based on gender. That means God God values and loves his sons as much as he values and loves his daughters.